conocimiento se fortalece cuando los nodos logran interconectarse. Bienvenidos al primer simposio iberoamericano de Mirmecología, versión en línea. Ok. Uh, well, um, to me, it's an honor to present our first lecturer. He is an evolutionary biologist and professor of the Department of Ecology and Evolution at the University of Lausanne. In addition, he is a reference and expert in the study of the evolution of social insects, studying animal behavior, ecology, and evolutionary genetics and genomics. In the social behavior study, uh, carried him to inclined to prim primates research. However, he didn't like the methodology used to study them. And heard a talk of the entomologist, Daniel Cheris, he decided to study ants. We welcome the Dr. Lauren Keller and his talk, Sex, Supergenes, and Sociality. Dr. Lauren, thank you for being part of this. Is that symposium. okay now? Yes, Dr. Lauren, it's okay. Okay, I can start? Yes, Dr. Lauren. Okay. So, me hace mucho placer de ser aquí. Y no sé si conoce esta hormiga. ¿Cómo se llama? ¿Qué especie es de esta hormiga? No sé. Y se llama Maradona Species. ¿Por qué? Tiene el balón con el jugar de, de Argentina, que es un nombre que probablemente conoce. Entonces, <laughs> I'm going to move to, to my talk. And I, I think you know what this number is, because many of you are in the field. So this number is the number of ants you can... Oopla, I don't know what's happening. Something went strange. Ooh. Wait, let me went through. Something went strange. Okay, let's start again. So it's a number of ants. Now it's, I don't know, it's moving along. It's a number of ants uh, on the world. And so this number is really huge. So if you want to know what it means, Imagine that you take all ants and you put them one in front of the other one. Uh, what you will find is that you can go 165 times from Earth to the Sun. So that gives you a number, an idea about the number of ants uh, in the world. And as you know, ants are in, an important part of the biomass on Earth, and their weight is about equal as the weight of all humans uh, together, which is quite amazing. And they're also very interesting in terms of intraspecific polymorphism. So in many species, um, I don't know if you can, can you see my arrow? I don't know. Maybe you can see it, maybe not. So let yes, us... Yes, Dr. Lauren, we can see Okay. It. So um, in many species, you can have a polymorphism. And here in the, for those snails, for example, this is a genetic polymorphism. So depending on your genes, you will be one more for another one. And in some other species, um, the, you can have different morphs, but it depends on the environment. So depending on the environment, you develop e either into this morph or this one. And so it's quite interesting to know uh, what's the basis for that. Another type of polymorphism is in many species, you have males, hopla, again, it goes along, I don't know why. It went out. Sorry. So in many species, you can have um, males and females, which can look uh, very differently. Even in some cases, they've been uh, described as uh, different species. And even in humans, you can have a lot of variability between individuals within a single species. And this is an example of two people on the upper side, which look very different, but their brain is very similar. And in the downside, you have another person whose brain is extremely different from the brain of the two uh, people with the flags. And all this occurs in a single species, which show you that within a species, you can have a lot of uh, polymorphism. And social insects are partly interesting, uh, and ants in particular, because within a species, you can have very different morphs. So here for farms, you can see different type of workers, which differ in size. 
and you have a queen on the right side. Right side. So they differ both in size and in uh, morphology. And another interesting feature is that within a single species, you can have different types of social organization. And one difference in social organization, which is important, is the number of queens per colony. Uh, and as you will see, there are many species in which you can have a, multiple, a single queen per colony or uh, colonies which contain multiple queens, and this can be polymorphic in many species, as we, as we will see. And sometimes those uh, phenotypic variation uh, among individuals can be extremely marked. Uh, so on the left side, you can see here different types of workers, uh, small workers. Here you have a soldier, so you have huge variation. Here you have a male, and here you have a queen. So you have extreme difference in uh, phenotypes. And all females develop from the same type of eggs, and males uh, develop from unfertilized eggs. And here you have two workers, one sitting on the head of the other one, uh, which show you uh, an idea about how the uh, dimorphic they can be. And so the most important polymorphism is, of course, linked to the queen worker uh, polymorphism. So uh, as in humans, uh, in a colony, you can have a, a queen, and the queen uh, will lay the eggs, and as in humans, the workers will do all the hard work in the colony. And these uh, phenotypic differences are associated with um, difference in lifespan. So the queens can be live very long in social insects. Here we have different types of uh, insects. Uh, and you can see there's uh, all type of insects from diptera, butterflies. And usually insects don't live very long. They live a few weeks, sometimes a few months. But there are three exceptions, the termites, the ants, and the bees, where the queens can be very long lived, up to almost 30 years in some ant species, which is really amazing for an insect. And on this phylogeny, we compare the lifespan of different group of insects, and we show that at three times when social life evolved, it has been associated with a huge increase in the lifespan of the queens by about 100 times. And so if you think of primates, it, it would be like if you find a primate which lived 4,000 years. And interestingly, the workers which are genetically identical to the queens usually have a much uh, shorter lifespan, 10 or 20 times uh, smaller, which is quite interesting for studies of aging because you have, can have one genotype which produces two phenotypes which differs uh, greatly in uh, lifespan. So it's a very good system to study uh, aging. And now the question is, of course, what makes you becoming a queen or a worker? Um, so in many species, there's no genetic differences between queens and workers. And it's only during development, depending on the food or ferment, that an egg will develop into a queen or a worker. And the males are a bit different because they develop from unfertilized eggs. So the queen can decide about the sex of her babies by fertilizing the eggs or not. And if the egg is not fertilized, then you have the development of an haploid uh, male. And um, so it used to be thought that those uh, differences is, uh, between females is only due to their environment. And this is what is found in textbooks. But you should never trust te textbooks, because in the last few years, we have found several cases uh, where there is a genetic basics, uh, basis for caste determination. For example, in many, several prognomic species, uh, queens mate with two types of males, and um, they mate with a male which is from the same genetic lineage, and males which are from a different genetic lineage. And the offspring which are fathered by males of the same genetic lineage develop into queens, and the offspring which are fathered by males of the other genetic lineage develop into workers. And here you have a very strict uh, genetic basis for caste determination. So you have two types of queens in the population, lineage one or lineage two. So they produce males of their own lineage, but they both mate with, mates with males of their own lineage and the other lineage. And all workers in those population are types of hybrids between lineage one and lineage two. So now there have been several other species which has been found of Pogonomyrmex and also other species which have this mode of caste determination. Then we found another species in Cataglyphis cursor, which is a species which live in southern Europe. And we found that queens produce new, produce workers by normal sexual reproduction, 
but when they produce new queens, they use parthenogenesis, uh, so they don't fertilize the eggs by the sperm, but they, they, produce a, uh, they, they produce an egg which only comes from themselves. And so it's a type of asexual uh, reproduction. And this is good in some way because by so doing, they can keep the genetic diversity for the workers, but then they can transmit all their genes to their daughters, queens, uh, because they do it in an asexual way. So they have both the benefits uh, of sex, uh, but not the cost of sex, which is uh, normally decreased genetic diversity. And finally, we have found a, a third species, uh, Westmania uh, ropontata, which you have in the uh, northern part of the South America and Central America. And we found that in that species, queens also produce new queens asexually, actually by clonal reproduction, so they are be really clones, and they produce workers by sexual reproduction. And in that species, workers are completely sterile. And so this is quite interesting because it means there's one sex which has a zero reproductive success. So which sex is it? So that would be males, because males, it means they will only father eggs which develop into workers, which are completely sterile. And so they will have zero reproductive success. But in that species, what we found that males also reproduce clonally. So the sperm enters the egg, probably it removes the maternal genome, and then we have the production of a new male, which is a clone from the father. And actually all males are produced clonally from the father, all queens are produced clonally from the mother, and so it means you have no more gene flow between males and females. It's like two different species, one which has only males and one which has only females, but they need each other to produce the workers uh, which are the injuries which will uh, do the work in the colony. And since then, there have been at least three other species which have been found to have such a mode of reproduction. And they expect that probably 20 or 30 percent of the end species have one of the mode of reproduction of the three species I mentioned here. And this is just because people before, they don't realize that because they had no genetic markers. And even when they had genetic markers, they had strange data. And they didn't realize that this was due to this unusual uh, mode of reproduction. But I'm sure we will find many uh, more cases in the future. Um, so now, here we were speaking about cast determination, which is the first type of uh, polymorphism, this morphological polymorphism within colony. And now I would like to move to the social polymorphism, which occurs in many uh, ant species. So this is a work I did in collaboration with my colleague Ken Ross from the University of Georgia. And I will present some work which was mostly done by John Wang, who was a postdoc with me, who is now a professor in uh, Taiwan. And Yannick Wurm was also involved now, is a professor in, um, in uh, England. And so this is work we did with um, Franz and Nopsis Invicta, uh, which is native from uh, South America probably comes from Argentina, uh, but they also occurs in other countries in South America. And they've been introduced in the US about uh, 90 years ago. Uh, they've been also introduced in Australia, now they are spreading in the US, and more recently they've been also introduced in China, and they're starting to spread uh, in uh, Asia. And people don't like this ant because it has a slightly painful sting, as you can see here. And they are very aggressive ants, that is, as soon as they touch your skin, they will uh, sting you. And interestingly, so you have those two social forms, the monogyne form, which is a single queen. Um, as you will see, it, the queen is large. It uses independent colony founding, that is, the queens depart on a mating flight, and uh, it mates with one male, and then it starts a new colony on its own. And in the social form, there is strong aggression uh, between colonies. In the polygyne form, you can have multiple queens, up to 100 uh, within a colony. As you will see, they are smaller. And after mating flight, instead of starting a new colony on their own, they return to an established colony. And eventually, they will start new colonies nearby by leaving the mother colony on foot to start a, a new colony uh, close to the mother uh, colony. And here, you have no aggression uh, between uh, colonies. So, um, when I was a postdoc, we were interested to know if there was a genetic differences uh, between the two social forms. 
And we were using allozymes, so this is work that Ken was doing, to see if there was gene flow between the two social forms, the idea to try to find some difference in allele frequencies between the two social forms. And as you can see, for most of the markers, there was no uh, difference in allele frequency. But there were two exceptions. One is PGN3 and one is uh, GP9. And for both of these loss sites, there's important variation in frequency of the most common allele between the monogyne form in blue and in red. So today I will talk about GP9, but, um, but the, the gene is actually linked to PGM3, which explains uh, that. So for GP9, you have two alleles. It's called the big B and small b allele. And in the monogyne colonies, all individuals, the queen, the reproductive queens, the non-reproductive queens, which are the winged queens you have in the colony, and the workers, they are all homozygote for uh, the big B uh, allele. Uh, in polygyne colonies, it's quite uh, different uh, because uh, you can find the three genotypes, but you have uh, important variation from the Hardy-Weinberg distribution. Actually, there are very few homozygotes for the big B allele, many individuals which are heterozygote, and you have some uh, individuals which are uh, homozygote for the big B allele, but you can see variation between uh, queens, workers, and non-reproductive queens. And actually what was really strange is that all the queens which had been genotypes are uh, uh, heterozygotes. We never found uh, all the queens are never homozygote for the small b or big b allele. And so uh, Ken Ross did some studies and he found that the big b, a small b allele behaves like a little recessive alleles so that all females queens, not of predictive queens and workers, which are mozygote for the small b allele, they die soon after they close from the pupae. So this provides an explanation for that. And then we were wondering what's happening for those queens. So you find some young queens with this genotype, but they never become reproductively, uh, reproductively active. So we thought maybe they look a bit differently. So we just looked to the weight and fecundity, and we found a strong effect of GP9 uh, means, which means uh, general protein 9. So we didn't know what was this gene was. I will come to that later. Uh, and we found that this gene is associated with important variation in weight, with big B, big B queens being heavier than the two other queens. And they lay also many more eggs and queens of the two uh, other genotypes. And we saw that maybe those phenotypic differences may affect the probability of queens to be, to be accepted in the colony. As I mentioned, in the polygyne colonies, queens depart on a mating flight, but after, instead of trying to start their own colony, they return to an established colony. So we tried to mimic this process in the lab, and so we took 20 winged queens from each of 19 colonies, and uh, we isolated them during three days in little cups, and then uh, we took those queens and reintroduced them in the mother colony. So these were 20 queens from each of 19 colonies. And what we observed is that some queens will be readily accepted. They will walk to the nest. But some of the queens, like this one, they will be attacked by workers. So those workers are attacking this queen. And then it takes uh, only a few minutes until those uh, workers will cut the queen into several pieces, which was in most cases uh, lethal for the queens. And then um, we genotyped the uh, the queens which were attacked and non-attacked, and we found that there was a strong effect of the genotype. So those individuals in the first experiment, they were seven to 10 days old, and we found that the workers attacked only big, 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 big queens. They never attacked queens of the two other genotypes. And we repeated that with older queens, and we found the same pattern, only big, 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 big queens are attacked. And actually, the older those queens are, the more likely they are to be attacked. Here there were 60% when they were 11 to 14 days, 90% of them were attacked. And when they were fully reproductively mature, 100% of them will be attacked. So this showed that workers attacked and killed the big, 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 big queens when they initiate reproduction. So now we have an explanation for that, for those data. So those queens do not, those females do not exist because of the lethal effect of the small b allele. 
And those queens do not exist because they are killed by workers when they start reproducing. Actually, when they are very young, you have also about 40% of those uh, queens, just like workers. But when they start to develop, they start to be killed in their colony. So here you can see non-reproductive queens, already one half have been killed by workers. And here 100% of them have been killed by workers when they are fully reproductively mature. And those results were a bit surprising because if you remember, so the queens which are killed are the big, 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 big queens. And if you remember, the queens are the ones which are the heavier one and the one which lay more eggs. So this is really strange because when you are taught uh, at, at school, we are learned uh, from uh, evolution that selection, selection years which are the bigger ones, which lays uh, more babies. But here, the workers killed what seemed to be the better queen. And when we did those experiments, we had no clue why workers would kill uh, those queens. So it took us several years um, to come up with an idea. And after a few years, we thought that maybe this could be due to an effect of a selfish gene. Um, a selfish gene is a gene which does something which is good for its own propagation, but which is bad for the organism in which it, it is. So, for example, I don't know if you know meiotic drive genes, but in mice, in Clozophila, you have genes which are expressed in the sperm, which produce a toxic substance and which kills the sperm, but the gene is associated with another gene which makes it immune to the uh, toxic substance. So if the male is heterozygote, then you will only produce a sperm which carry one copy of the gene which produces a toxic substance and the antidote, and so this gene will spread in the population. So we thought maybe we could have something similar for this uh, gene, and this could be a selfie gene which is associated with a small B allele, which will induce workers which do carry one copy of that allele to kill the big B, big B queens. So it will be here the blue workers which will attack the big B queen. And so to test that, what we did is we introduced again big B, big B queens and big B, uh, small B queens in polychain colonies. And we collected the workers which were attacking the big B, big B queens. We genotyped them and compared the genotypic frequencies with workers which were around heterozygote queens. And what we found is uh, we genotyped 470 workers and we found that it uh, was only or mostly uh, heterozygote workers, uh, those heterozygote workers which were attacking the big B, uh, big B queen, which support uh, what I mentioned. So the question is, how can workers discriminate between those two types of queens? When I did those experiments, I noticed that some of the workers which were attacking the queens uh, would themselves be attacked by other workers, um, suggesting that there's something on the surface of the cuticle of the queen which can be transferred to the cuticle of workers and elicit the behavior, aggressive behavior by other workers. So we did a simple experiment where we took workers, we rub them, that is, we take them and move them on the cuticular um, on the cuticle of big B, big B queens, or heterozygote queens, we reintroduced them in the mother colony and we recorded the behavior of other workers. And what we found that the queen, the workers which were rubbed on big B, big B queens, um, suffered high aggression. So aggression goes from zero to three. So there was really high aggression toward workers rubbed on big B, big B queens, and only low aggression on the one which were rubbed on heterozygote queens. And actually, 40% of those queens uh, were, of those workers were even killed by nestmate uh, workers. Whereas none of those inuits, uh, rub on heterozygote queens, uh, would be killed by uh, their nestmates. So this really shows there's an order on the surface of the cuticle, which is different between big B, big B queens and heterozygote queens. And that this is what the workers are using to recognize and discriminate against those big B, big B queens. So as I mentioned, when we did those expands, we had no clue what was uh, GP9. Uh, but then I had one of my graduate students, Michael Krieger. We went on to do a postdoc with, with Ken Ross. And so they cloned and sequenced a gene and they found it's an odorant binding protein 
which in insect actually uh, is a protein which can carry pheromone into immunum of insects. So it's well possible that this gene could be directly linked in order differences between queens and also in the perception of order by workers, explaining why workers of different genotypes behave differently towards the two types of queens. And we are currently doing experiments to really find out what is the chemical difference between the two types of, type of queens, which elicit the difference of behavior of workers. And interestingly, between the big B and the small B allele, there are nine mutations. And eight of those mutations are non synonymous mutation, indicating that there's been strong directional selection acting on a CSG. So to summarize, uh, here we have a genetic basis for social organization. In monochine colonies, you have always a big B, big B queen, which depart on the mating flight. And those queens uh, have a lot of fat, and they can start a new colony on their own. They lay eggs that they will feed from their body reserves, and the colony will grow to a new colony. Uh, and when you have only big B, big B workers, they will never accept more than one queen, so it will be the mother queen. In contrast, in polychine colonies, you have, uh, they can produce three types of queens, which differ in the phenotype. You have the large big B, big B queens, intermediate size heterozygote queens, and the small, small B, small B queens. And those size differences affect what queens can do. Here, we think that those big B, big B queens, like monogyne queens, can start a new colony on their own. But we are not 100% sure because they fly really high in the air, so we cannot track them uh, during ma mating flight. Uh, by contrast, heterozygote queens, they don't have enough fat reserve to start a new colony on their own. They can produce only a few workers, but not enough to survive. But those ones, they can be readily accepted in polychine colonies, whereas those ones, they will never be accepted in polychine colonies because they will be killed by the heterozygote workers. And the small b, small b queens, they have no option. Their only possibility in life is to die. So on those polychine colonies, when you have heterozygote workers, they will accept several queens, but they will accept only heterozygote queens. And we did some experiments uh, showing that you need only 5 to 10% heterozygote workers uh, to make a transition from a monogyne type of colony to a polygyne type uh, of common. So what we showed that a single genetic element influences the behavior of workers. This genetic element is responsible for the existence of two distinct social forms. And that was the first genetic element shown to have a major effect on social organization in any type uh, of social organization. And uh, after that, we found that the same genetic element also influenced social organization. Actually, it's not three, it's uh, five most closely related species of fans. Now we know of six species where social organization is completely linked to the genotype at GP9. And I will get back to that uh, in the final part of this talk. So now that was quite interesting, but the question is, can a single gene, in that case GP9, or this order binding factor, account for the many differences for example, different in queen size, different in order of queens, the model of colony founding, the lethal effect of the small b allele when the mosaicot. There are also differences in worker size, worker behavior. So males of different genotype have different amount of sperm. Um, so can a single gene uh, do all those differences? Or alternatively, are there other genes which are linked to GP9, which are uh, important to explain those differences? And so, to address this question, my student, mostly Yannick Grum and John Wang, told me we need to do a, a genome of an ant. But that was about uh, 15 years ago. Now, it, to do a genome, it's very easy. But at that time, it was really difficult to do when we started. Actually, almost 20 years ago, 18 years ago, I think we started. Because it took us many years to make this genome. Uh, so, we made this genome, and as this was published here, but it's um, like old genome, it's quite a boring study. But there was something quite interesting. We found that there was 16 link linkage group. So 
So there are a group of genes uh, which supposedly are linked together. And 16 is really interesting because it's a number of chromosome of friends. So here you have source, here we have different markers, and here you have the 16 chromosome of friends. And in red here, it's quite interesting because this is where GP9 is. So we identified GP9 to be uh, on chromosome 16. And what we found interestingly, we had many markers on this uh, chromosome and other markers. And we did progeny families. That is, we take a queen and we look uh, their babies to, to know where the genes are. You take the babies and you look for recombination. So two genes which are near to each other on the chromosome, the priority of recombination is much smaller than if they are far apart on the chromosome. And when we did that, so there should always be some recombination between genes, maybe less if they are nearby. But a surprise that was on 60% uh, of the chromosome, and this is uh, 12 megabases, there was no recombination at all. And this was really interesting because it was on chromosome 16. And this is, uh, this is where GP9 is, actually. So GP9 is in a region where there is no recombination uh, between injuries which have a big B and uh, the small B uh, added. And so John did some uh, analysis um, by, um, and, and he found that, um, that actually um, there is a large region with no recombination and that is actually an inversion. And it, it could show by cytology that there's an inversion. And we did more studies, uh, more recently with genomic studies, and we found actually that there are actually three inversions here. So this is the same region. And you had first a large inversion which occurred, about 500, uh, 500 half, half a million years ago. Um, and then you had the second inversion, which occurred nearby, and then the third inversion, which goes very close to the centromeres. So basically here, the three inversions are here, and this is what prevents uh, recombination uh, between uh, the big B and small B uh, alleles, uh, because the chromosome is inverted, so you cannot recombine anymore with the other half. So to summarize, um, we have... Uh, Social organization is explained by something which is very special, what we call a social chromosome. So the monogyne and polygyne form they are identical for 15 chromosomes, but there's one chromosome which affects the size of the queens. So if you have two copies of the big B, uh, we call it social SB haplotype. It's, it's an haplotype. We call it uh, S big B haplotype. So if you have two copies of the big B haplotype, uh, you produce those large queen and you have the monogyne form. If you have one copy of the small B haplotype, you have the intermediate size colonies, and these are the queens you will find in the polygyne colonies. And if you have two copies of the small B haplotype, then you have those tiny queens which will die. And this is really interesting because it looks very similar to something else that we have seen uh, before. What is it? When you have a single chromosome which affects your phenotype. And of course, it's very similar to what occurs uh, in mammals about the sex chromosomes. If you have two copies of the sex chromosome, the X chromosome, you become a female. And if you have one copy of the X and one of the Y, then you become a male. And as you note, the Y is a bit degenerate, so it has lost male genes. And here we found also that the small b also degenerate because the small b cannot recombine with itself. And uh, so it has started to degenerate. And actually, this is why uh, if you have two copies of the small b allele, it's lethal. If you will create a human with two copies of the Y chromosome, it will also be lethal because there are many important genes which are only on the X chromosome, but not on the Y chromosome. And so it's very similar, so the Y and the small b have degenerated much more for the y than the small b. And if you will have two copies of this degenerate uh, chromosome, then you will die both in humans and in, in the ants. And so here you have a genetic basis with the single species, which allow you to produce two phenotypes, males or females, 
or the large queens from monochain colonies or the medium-sized uh, queens of polychain colonies. So to conclude, social organization in the far end, um, synapsis invicta, is regulated by a pair of uh, social chromosomes. Uh, when colonies contain more than 10 percent heterozygote workers, you have a polychain colony. Um, the non-recombining region of the social chromosome contains about 600 genes. Um, so one question is how many are involved? How did this region uh, evolve? And this is something we are working at. We are developing CRISPR-Cas and also doing comparative analysis. And we found that this uh, super, super gene um, actually evolved about half a million years ago. We actually think it even moved across species. So we have data showing that it moved between closely related uh, species uh, of ferns. And the social chromosome has many properties of sex chromosome. And uh, because there's no recombination between the big B and small B haplotype, just as there's no recombination between the X and Y chromosome, and this leads to the one chromosome which does not recombine, the Y chromosome, but in our case it's a small b uh, chromosome, to degenerate and in uh, with two copies of this uh, genotype will be uh, unviable. And so this social chromosome uh, has many properties of sex chromosome, so it's an interesting system to see how non the lack of recombination leads to degeneration. And so in social insects, many species um, of social insects have different type of social organization. Uh, it used to be thought that it's purely environmental, but here we have found a case where it's purely genetics. And actually it has now been, we know now of six species of ferns, which are either monogynous or polygynous. We know it's due to the same, uh, same social chromosome. And my colleague, uh, Michel Chapuza, who is also from the University of Lausanne, and his colleagues have found that in Formica, you also have monochain and polychain colonies. And uh, whether you are monochain or polychain also depends on the social chromosome, which is not the same as the one in France. It's on the other chromosome, there are other genes, but there's also a genetic basis for whether you are monochainous or polychainous. And my prediction is that in the near future, we will find many other end species and probably other type of social organisms uh, where the polymorphic Polymorphism in social organization is also due to this type of uh, social chromosome. And on that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. That was my first talk on, <laughs> on Zoom or whatever this platform uh, which I discovered today. So it's not easy not to have somebody in front. And I'm sure it was not easy for you to follow the talk, but I, I hope it was uh, okay. Thank, so you thank you very much to you, Dr. Lauren. Uh, it was an amazing talk. And so we are going to start with the questions. Uh, just to remember that here we have an option that is ask a question where you can uh, make the question for the Dr. Laurent. So the first question is, in the species that the queen lives until 10 years, the colony produce genes just when the queen is next to die? Um, no, in many end species it varies, but um, so the colony grows gradually and it starts to produce new uh, queens when it re reaches a, a size um, which is close to maximum. And typically it will start after three or four years. It depends on which, which species, sometimes two years, three years, four years. And then every year it will produce a new sexuals until uh, the colony uh, disappears. Dr. Laurent? Yes. Okay, is that uh, we are not um, seeing you. Um, okay. I myself, but I don't know how it works. <laughs> I don't know if I remove, uh, should I say, should I do something or? If you want, you, you can stop to, to share the screen. Okay. Okay. Okay, so the second question is the ability of workers to reproduce creating mal X 
seems to be well documented in several common temperate species, such as some Myrmica, Formica, and more. It seems less documented in tropical species. Yeah, I think uh, it's an interesting yeah. question would be, um, cool. I think people have less studied genetically uh, tropical species, but it's, I, I don't know if there's good data to that, but it, it will be interesting to see if there's an association between where species live, tropical or like here in Europe, and if the species in tropics um, are less likely to lay eggs. For example, polygyny is less common in the tropics than it is here. And here you have a gradient. I think in the north, for example, when it's really cold, the conditions are not very good. You are more likely to have polygynous species than you have in the tropics. Okay. Um, another question is, is there an environmental variable that selects for BLL in GP9 or any idea on what can select for it? I didn't understand. Is there an environmental factor selecting for what? GP9? Uh, so, um, I'm not sure I understand the question, but uh, if it's if there are environmental factor for selecting for monogyny or polygyny, the response is yes. For example, in France, the monogyny form is really good to colonize new habitats. So the queens depart on a mating flight, maybe can fly a few kilometers away. And so if you have a new empty habitat, they are really good to colonize that. But um, once they are somewhere, the polygynous form is better because if you have an empty spot, then the Queens and workers can leave um, their colony within half an hour and go directly to this empty spot. So what typically occurs is that the monogynous form colonizes new habitats, but then it's taken over by the polygynous form. So environment and stability of the environment is very important to determine the relative abundance of monogyne and polygyne colonies. Okay. If the chromosome containing GP9 behaves as sex chromosome, did you try the experiment in Solenopsis invicta or Wasmania, including males? Or do you have any information about this chromosome in males? So, um, so it, it, there's a pretty of sex chromosomes, but um, in ants, so there, there are no sex chromosomes in ants because sex Determination is determined by the number of chromosomes you have. If you are deployed, you become a male. If you are deployed, you become a female. And so sex chromosomes occur in many species, but there are many species which have other mechanisms of sex determination. And Hymenoptera, the bees, the ants, uh, um, they have this system of haplodiploidy with males being haploid and females uh, deployed. Um, the, the, gene which influence uh, sex determination is similar to actually vertebrates. It's called the tra, tra genes, transformer gene. And in the honeybee, it has been uh, identified. You have this transformer gene and a duplicated gene, which is nearby. And these are the two genes which are, import are important to, to influence caster determination. But this depends on whether you have one or two copies uh, of that gene, uh, which influence your sex. Uh, okay, and how can the availability of resources affect the size of the subcasts? Uh, this is a very good question, actually. What, what makes you becoming a, a small worker, intermediate size worker, a large worker, or a queen? And actually, it's not well known. Um, probably the insulin pathway is linked to that, so it's linked to metabolism, but it's not very clear what type of food uh, the amount of food or quality of food, how it really affects cast determination. Uh, the, study, the species which has been best studied would be the honeybee, but even in the honeybee, it's not very clear. There have been many studies claiming that this was important for cast determination, but then there's been another study which would show something else, and exactly what triggers development of uh, um, a female into different morphs is, is not yet well known. And we found in other species, actually in Pogonomimex, it can be also maternal effect. So the queen puts something in the egg, which will influence whether an egg develops into a queen or a worker. So I think it can be the environment, there can be some genetic basis, 
but also maternal effect which uh, interact with the two influence gas determination. Okay, Dr. Laurent, and we don't have uh, more questions. Uh, thank you very much for, for being part of the symposium, for accept our invitation and share with all of us uh, all your 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 research. It's an honor to, to us to have you. Uh, well, I think that we have another question. Yeah. What other three fire ant species with similar social organization based on uh, UB9 gene? Say again, what other, what, what other? What, what are the other three fire ant species with similar uh, social? So the other species, uh, Solenopsis richteri, uh, Solenopsis um, uh, quinque caspus, Solenopsis, um, which was the other one, quinque caspus. So, so this we published early on in a paper in Nature, Ecology and Evolution. Uh, Caspus. There is one, it's called AD, ADRX because it has not yet been uh, described. Um, and which one? Well, I don't remember the name of the other species. I will have to look in, into the paper. Okay, Dr. Lauren. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, Hi, Dr. I'm going to try to listen to more of the talks. It's, um, it's a great idea to have that. Uh, and congratulations for this uh, organizing this symposium. Thank you very much for inviting me. Mm, thank you. Visita nuestra página web o comunícate a nuestro correo electrónico.